Me. Yes. Okay, so I think we're on air now, hopefully. Um, I've got nobody to confirm if we actually are. Um, so for those of you who do log in or watch at a later date, um, I'm Simon Devitt. Um, I'm the one responsible uh, for Maquanix, which is now live on Kickstarter. So if you have uh, the ability and the will uh, to donate, there's a link in the low bar just down below. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the first of what I hope will be many of these conversations, even after the Kickstarter has finished, where we're going to have some brief conversations with people uh, working to actively develop uh, large-scale quantum technologies, whether that be uh, communications, computation, or anything in between. Uh, so first, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, the first member of these chats, which is uh, Professor Jeremy O'Brien from the Center for Quantum Photonics in Bristol. Uh, so, Jeremy, thanks for joining us, and uh, yeah, thanks for being the first to try this out, which I've never done oh, before. My pleasure. Mm. So, basically, the idea behind this is just a bit of informal chat about what quantum computation is, what the technology is you're trying to develop, and uh, hopefully where this stuff is, is going to be headed uh, mm -hmm. in the next 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, um, however far in the future you want to speculate. Um, so you work primarily on linear optics. Uh, so just, you know, the 30 to 45 second rundown of what that is. Sure. So, um, yeah, as you say, we're pursuing a photonic approach to quantum computing. And in that approach, uh, you encode uh, information in single particles of light, uh, which we call photons. And that has the uh, great advantages that um, photons are very low noise systems. So they... Uh, effectively coupled to a zero temperature bath and we see the evidence of that in the microwave background polarization uh, the microwave background radiation that we view from left over from the big bang is polarized uh, which tells us that the lifetime of those uh, quantum systems is at least at the age of the universe um, so low noise is a is a key key feature um, photons are relatively easy to manipulate we know a lot about how to manipulate photons from manipulating a uh, light in general and so we have the world wired up photonically at the moment in, in telecommunications networks and we're starting to wire up uh, data centers optically and we're soon going to start wiring up um, computer chips optically so replace the, the copper interconnects with photonic interconnects um, so it's a sort of familiar technology if you like um, and the other advantage of photons is that they move at the speed of light which is great in a quantum computer because um, just as in a conventional computer, a lot of the operation of a, of a quantum computer is uh, moving information around, and so it's relatively easy to move information from one place to another if it's encoded in a photon. So that's all the good news. Um, the bad news for photonic uh, approaches to quantum computing is that, um, that photons don't readily interact with one another. So if you want to make a logic gate uh, between two photons, as you would for any computer, so that the kind of quantum analog of an XOR gate, if you like, where uh, one bit is uh, flipped or not uh, contingent on the state of the other bit. Well, the lack of uh, the lack of noise in these systems results from their lack of interaction with anything, uh, including one another. And um, so, I'm conscious that I'm going on for more than my allotted uh, 35 <laughs> <three> seconds. <laughs> if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll try and wrap up no. the rest of the story. So in, uh, in 2000, 2001, um, this problem uh, was overcome in a theoretical breakthrough by Camille Laflamme and Milburn, who showed that, in fact, if you introduce additional photons beyond the ones which you're uh, performing the computation on, you can induce an effective interaction between the photons that are, that are part of the computer itself. So that was an extraordinary breakthrough, a theoretical breakthrough, which showed that um, that quantum, uh, photonic quantum computing was uh, was feasible, and I use the word feasible to mean um, mathematically feasible. So, it, there weren't an exponential number of uh, components required to make it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, in the in, in the intervening uh, fifteen years, uh, that theoretical proposal has been improved upon and improved upon, uh, so that the, the the overhead, so the number of those additional photons for example, that you need has uh, reduced by five to six orders of magnitude to make it a much more realistic, um, much more realistic approach. And what we've been working on uh, over the last uh, five years in a, in a serious way is um, 
worrying about the, uh, the the scalability of that approach. And so you know better than me, Simon, about the need for modules and a modular architecture. So yeah. scalable to me for a quantum computer means that uh, you you have identifiable modules and that when you redesign your computer by when you when you scale up your computer by an order of magnitude or two, you don't have to redesign from scratch. Um, you use the same design approach and principles and so on. And so we've come up with that um, with that uh, scalable architecture, if you like. And the final piece to the puzzle, and in my mind, the most important piece of the puzzle, is um, manufacturability. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to take an extreme position, I could imagine a scalable architecture for a quantum computer that was, uh, you know, the size of a, you know, a, a, a largish building, for example. It's scalable because I identify the modules in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have this design rules and so on, but each of those modules samples from the entire periodic table and I specify atom by atom every where every one of those things goes, uh, where every atom in the module is. And I would say that's scalable, but it's not manufacturable by uh, the definition that I like of manufacturable, which is a very practical uh, sense in which um, you, uh, you, you know, you, it, it wouldn't defy the laws of physics to build that thing. It, would, it just might require the, uh, the construction of a fabrication facility the cost of which would exceed the GDP of the planet by several orders of magnitude. Yeah, that's always a problem. So that's that's uh, <laughs> that's why sort of definition is scalable. And the exciting thing about photonic uh, quantum computing is that, in fact, you can build the whole system in a um, in a silicon uh, computer chip fabrication facility that exists today. So those facilities, you know, uh, cost about ten billion dollars state of the art facilities to to make now the, the sort of things that make the chips that go in your in your uh, smartphones, for example. So, I mean, just to boil it down, sort of the, the, the nitty gritty of, of what's the hardest thing about linear optics, and I, th I think your analogy to microwave photons is, is a good example. If, you know, the, the information in a microwave photon from the beginning of the universe can persist up until now, these things just don't interact with anything. So That's deliberately getting them to interact is extremely difficult. Yeah, so that's right. So, and in fact, as as uh, I'm sure you would uh, agree, I think if we look at the um, you know the list of requirements for a quantum computer, they're almost contradictory, right? You need these um, very low noise systems, which means systems that don't interact with with it, with their environment. But then we need to perform logic gates on them, which means very strong interactions with uh, with another qubit, and we need to initialize and read them out, which means very strong interactions with the apparatus with which we do that, mm -hmm. and so. They're, they're kind of they're, they're almost contradictory requirements, and um, I like the, the examples of um, you know photons, great low noise systems as we just described, um, hard, hard to get them to interact. And the other extreme is let's say the spin of an electron, very easy to get them to interact. Right, you just bring them into proximity with one another, and you have dipole and exchange forces coupling them together. So that's very easy to get them to interact. Mm -hmm. But of course, they're also interacting with any other um, spin or magnetic field uh, in their proximity and in fact you know they of course sit on a charge as well so they're interacting with any any charge or electric field in their environment and I think you know you can imagine those two extremes and then the, the case is to um, you know is to trade those off against one another and I think the reason that I emphasize manufacturability is because in the end you've got to be able to make the thing and I think um, for photonics the summary is that you you pay an overhead in the number of components that you need because you have to introduce additional components to um, to to induce this effective interaction between them, but that's a small price to pay for being able to make the whole thing in the end. And the other point there, which is still an open question, is that it may in fact be the case that you don't pay any overhead uh, at all relative to uh, other systems because of the intrinsically low noise system that you have. So mm -hmm. um, it may be that you, that, as you know better than me, there are there are um, you know, very, very uh, stringent requirements for um, error correction and fault tolerance in a quantum computer. We have a kind of hybrid digital analog system and the analog feature of it makes error correction very, uh, very subtle, as does the fact that, you know, that error correction um, process mustn't disturb the quantum information that's encoded in the, uh, in the computer in, in doing that uh, sure, sure. correction. Um, and so, uh, the amount of error correction that you need and the overhead that you pay as a uh, as a result of that is contingent on the error uh, the errors in your system and so 
you can imagine a situation where you know where the low noise features of uh, of a photonic system end up uh, reducing the overhead that you pay in terms of error correction, and that's an open question. Okay. But <clears throat> yeah. So I mean, just um, the actual the the way your architecture works when you say it's, it's fabricated in silicon, it's not that the silicon is doing the processing. It's more like it, it's it's sort of like a racetrack where the photons will fly around within a silicon chip, but it's the photons themselves that are doing the computation, right? That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the system looks like um, uh, optical waveguides made in silicon, and so those waveguides you can think of as being very closely analogous to optical fibers. So, you know, the optical fibers that we use for telecommunications today are glass, and we have a um, we have a core in that glass fiber and a cladding um, around that glass fiber. And if the core has a slightly higher refractive index than the cladding, then um, you can uh, guide light uh, through that fiber. And in fact, you can arrange so that a, a, just a single transverse optical mode propagates in there. And that's exactly the sort of thing that we do in. Um, in silicon waveguides on silicon chips. Okay, so what's uh, what's your record in terms of number of photons so far, in terms of sort of the largest protocol you guys have been able to do on chip? Um, so I, I guess it's it, it's at the handful level, and I'm not sure that we we hold the record for that. I, we probably do. Um, I'm very much focused on a on a a uh, top down um, strategy at the moment. So. You know, I think quantum computing has proceeded uh, over the last, um, you know, decade or two in a, in a slightly pathological way where, you know, people have been predominantly in physics labs have, you know, got a qubit and, and uh, you know, characterized it very exhaustively, got a second qubit, seen if they can implement, you know, the, the quantum XOR gate between mm -hmm. those two things and slowly built up to the point where now, you know, we have of order you know, a dozen qubits, and we have some very impressive um, error correction uh, type operations in there. But what I, you know, what, what hasn't happened until relatively recently is people such as yourself, uh, who I characterize as, uh, as quantum computer architects, uh, who have at least for the last 10 years and probably for the last 15 years been telling people that um, for a useful quantum computer like that could do, that could do factoring use usefully, you need of order a million qubits. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, you guys uh, were very unpopular as you travelled the world telling people that because you know, people like myself in uh, in a physics lab with a handful of qubits um, didn't want to hear that the goal was a million. And I think what's happened, uh, and certainly something that I've been very consciously doing for the you know for the last several years, is saying, all right, well if if, if it's a million, it's a million. Let's get on with it and figure out how to do it. And um, so the the. Uh, the output of that for us is that um, you know, you, you know, if you need a if you need a million qubits or a million components, uh, a million qubits, then you need at least a million components and possibly mm -hmm. you know a few orders of magnitude more than that. So if you're talking millions to billions of components, then there's only one way that this planet knows how to uh, build systems with that number of components, you know, integrated into a level of complexity, and that's in silicon. You know, we. We now carry of order 10 billion transistors on our person at any given time, um, and, and that's the result of, you know, decades of development and trillions of investment in the semiconductor industry. And so our our approach to uh, quantum computing relies on being able to harness that technology. So the sort of the strategy is, you know, do X, Y, Z, and then use this 10 billion fabrication facility that exists, uh, and which uh, which capabilities um, are absolutely astounding. So that's the kind of um, that's the kind of uh, you know broad broad picture, and it's it's coming from I think the bottom up stuff of you know putting qubits together and characterizing them is is yep. really important and has to be done. But I think there also has to be a, a sort of top down, which is you know so how many components do you need for a useful machine at the end of this process, and how are you going to fabricate how are you going to fabricate them, and that's what we've really been focused on. Well, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, uh, certainly the top-down uh, you know, silicon industry fabrication process is a good way to start. Now, there's certainly been a lot of investment recently in the UK. I mean, how much of that and, and how influential has linear optics been in, in this kind of multi-million dollar push that especially the UK government has been putting into quantum technologies? And more broadly, quantum computing and large-scale applications more than just the sort of the, the handful of qubit level. 
Yeah, so the, the, the UK um, investment is very focused on, um, you know, on the translation and innovation side of quantum technologies. You know, I think it's, it's the case that um, uh, you, know, you can't make an investment of that scale just for fundamental research, and you shouldn't mm -hmm. make an investment, in my view. Um, and so it's very focused on, um, on seeing these technologies uh, develop to the point where they're, de they're deployed um, in the real world, as I call it, um, and it spans the full spectrum from, um, uh, you know, quantum communication, uh, quantum sensing and metrology, um, and quantum imaging, um, quantum, uh, quantum simulation and quantum computation. So it's the full spectrum and uh, photonics is at the center of, of that, uh, of that, um, that whole landscape. Because now you, it's not just the center for quantum photonics, you've also got a doctoral training center in quantum engineering, and uh, is it a new engineering startup that I've seen, Q, QSI? Well, sorry, I've forgotten the name. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of activity going on. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, so if you talk a bit about just in, just in our area, we have a uh, center for doctoral training, which um, I understand you're a partner on, and that's, uh, that's, that's a center for doctoral training in quantum engineering, so it's a PhD program and it's designed to train the engineers who will, who will work in the, uh, in the future quantum technology industry. Um, and the skills that they need are, you know, not just to understand the, the, the quantum physics at the heart of those technologies, but everything around it. Um, how to go from, you know, one, making one device that works um, in the lab in a sort of hero experiment type of thing to making millions of devices that, uh, that uh, routinely work uh, how to work with, uh, you know, in, in multidisciplinary teams where, you know, you're side by side at a bench with, you know, a chemist and a computer scientist and a physicist um, and so on. And how to uh, operate in, you know, in, in, in a startup and uh, in a large corporate in industry and, and all those sorts of skills. So that's very, uh, that's very exciting, um, those developments. So you're pretty much convinced that this is going to move forward right into the technology sector. This is not just a, an academic exercise. Yes, I am. Well, yes, yeah, so am I. <laughs> but I mean, because um, recently you were at Davos, weren't you? That's right. Yeah. How did that so, go, um, and how did that come about? Uh, so I have. Um, I was a young scientist at the World Economic Forum uh, uh, several years ago, and um, this year uh, they, you know, Klaus Schwab, the um, the director of the World Economic Forum, has. Uh, has um, sort of articulated a, uh, a key, a key um, uh, what should I call it? Um, I'll just describe it. The fourth industrial, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, which is essentially a convergence of, you know, many sort of exponential curves across technology, all happening um, simultaneously. As we have a you know highly interconnected world, we start to address big data uh, in in a serious way. Um, all of these things coming together simultaneously, and he, he sort of set, I guess, in some sense, a task for the forum this year to to really focus on uh, the opportunities and the threats that that fourth industrial uh, revolution uh, presents. And uh, quantum computing was a, um, you know, was a was a uh, was an example of the sort of uh, highly disruptive uh, technologies that are that are now looming. And you were the basically the only representative from the, well, at least the physics community working on quantum computing, or were there others there? Uh, so Andrew Firstman from um, One Qubit was also there. He's a oh, okay. tech pioneer at the World Economic Forum, um, and I think that was that was it. Yeah, that was about it. So in terms of where you see this going over the next ten or so years, I mean, in, maybe more respective to your technology. Um, I mean, based on what you've done in the previous decade, what do you think you can do in the next decade? And I suppose most people are going to ask as well, you know, when do you think something practical or something that the general public can play with um, might become available in optics? Um, so I guess, I, you know, the, something that the general public can play with, we already have. Um, we have a, 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 a two-qubit uh, quantum processor that's online. I don't have the... The website off the top of my I'll head. Make but, sure, um, I'll make sure I post it below. But uh, the, the yeah, chip, that chip is back online. Yes, I I, I think so. Um, and we we may well be upgrading that to a to a uh, a more powerful processor soon. And you know, 
It sounds, uh, it sounds, uh, it may sound trivial, but actually we have done a whole raft of very interesting um, things with that exact chip that anyone can access online. Uh, and they range from fundamental quantum physics. So we've done a, um, a Wheeler's Delay Choice Experiment, which is all about, um, you know, a, a, about how, how and why uh, quantum particles behave like uh, both particles and waves. And, uh, and uh, uh, I won't go into any more detail about that, but we did a quantum version of that delayed choice experiment with that device. Uh, we also um, implemented a new quantum chemistry algorithm that we developed jointly with Alan Asperi Guzik's group um, and notably uh, Jared McLean at Harvard. Um, so we have done, we've done all sorts of things with it. And I'm really excited about the prospects of people playing with that and uh, increasingly sophisticated uh, systems because, you know, the more people are thinking about what we can do uh, with, with quantum hardware, the sooner we're going to have, uh, you know, more exciting applications for it. So yeah, that's, I, you know, I, I that's, definitely that's agree. A somewhat facetious answer to your question. So the general public can play with these things now. I'll uh, answer another question, not that I'm a politician, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm uh, clear that by the end of um, this decade, we'll have a, we'll have a powerful machine that, um, that will be answering questions that we really care about the answer to and otherwise wouldn't be able to answer. Sorry, did you um, say within the decade or by the end of this decade? By the end of this decade. So on a five-year five time horizon, we'll have, we'll, we'll have the first instantiation of a machine um, that that achieves that, which is uh, which is really exciting. And you're crossing your fingers that it's linear optics. Uh, I I'm uh, I'm actually pretty clear that that's the only way that we'll achieve that goal, and it's because of this manufacturability, because of the fact that we can, uh, you, know, you know, we already are using semiconductor fabrication facilities that are used to make uh, computer chips to make our devices, and um, scaling that up then becomes a, a a, a very um, a very straightforward task relative to having to build the fabrication facility itself. Right, right. So, I mean, all, all your chip manufacturing now goes off-site to industrial partners. We we have a we have a broad spectrum. We we do some uh, stuff on site ourselves. Uh, we do some stuff with uh, university collaborators, and we do uh, a lot of stuff with. Uh, you know, in collaboration with industry, and we do uh, a lot of stuff in, in contract with uh, industry partners. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Wow, well, I mean, it does look like it might be a very promising way forward. I mean, uh, in terms of, because what, the, C, the CQP now at Bristol is be pretty close to 100 members now, wouldn't it? So it's a pretty, pretty yeah. big effort. That's right. And now you're bringing in more engineers, software people, um, not just hardcore experimental physicists. That's right, and I think it's about completing the stack. And I, you know, I would say people like yourself sit right in the middle of that stack, you know, at the kind of integration art architecture level. And I think we need to get from you know components to um, you know the real world applications that we care about for a quantum computer, um, and making that all connect up. And that's what we've been really focused on for the last several years. So, what's your in sort of? Uh your medium-term benchmarks, are you looking at specific algorithms to implement? Are you looking at, like, demonstrating, like, some of the other groups, um, small encoding techniques? Um, you know, what's on the horizon for the next 18 to, to 24 months? So in the, in the, um, uh, uh, I mean, where n is a, a small number less than 100 we're mm -hmm. focused on working out how we're going to get um, how we're going to get that ultimate machine that can do something useful that contains you know millions of components and so we're developing all of those components we're working on the integration of all of those components and then we're working on scaling it up we have an, we have an architecture at the moment where if you took the um, you know the best performance of all the components that has been reported and you glued it all together, then you would have a working quantum computer. So that's exciting because that means that there's, there's, no, uh, there's no outstanding physics questions uh, to be addressed there. Of course, it's a giant um, engineering and semiconductor process and fabrication challenge to be met to make all of those devices uh, work uh, together in that same, you know, with that same level of performance. 
Um, the architecture, of course, uh, as, as you know well, is uh, improving uh, by the day such that that gives you more headroom on the, uh, on the performance of the components. So that's the kind of strategy over the next 18 to 24 months is to work on the components, the architecture, and the integration of those components in a way that's, uh, you know, that, that is consistent with the, um, with the architecture. And most significantly is consistent with mass manufacture by the, by the millions or billions of components. Wonderful. Well, I suppose we're coming up on a half an hour now, and I wanted to try and keep these things reasonably short, um, just in case people, you know, start to glaze over a little bit. Um, but I think you've given quite a quite a nice update on where where Linear Optics is and where your group is. Um, certainly, anyone who's interested, from students to anybody else, is certainly recommended to go uh, to your website, which I'll link to in the video. And uh, we basically stop this. Yep. Um, so uh, I might let you go now, Jeremy. Terrific. All right. Well, thanks very much, Simon. No problem. And uh, we'll actually be back here again for another live hangout at 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific time in the U.S. And that next hangout will be with Dr. Oxton Fowler, who is with the Superconducting Group uh, at Google Inc. Um, so okay. hopefully if people are interested to come back in and take a look at that next 30-minute little snippet. So Brilliant. thank you all, and thanks, Jeremy, for being the, the first to try this out. I think it went reasonably well. Thanks very much, Son. Speak no to you soon. Cheers. Yeah.